Ladies and gentlemen, we have a winning streak. Your Locked On Panthers, your daily podcast on the Florida Panthers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into this Friday, February 10th edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. Thank you for making the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast your first listen of the day. I'm Armando Velez, and you can follow me on Twitter at Monoman12. Follow the show account on Twitter at LO underscore FLA Panthers. Make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. And don't forget to send in your screenshot of your subscription to the Locked On Florida Panthers YouTube channel and your five-star rating and send it over to me at LO underscore FLA Panthers on Twitter or email it at LockedOnFLA Panthers at gmail.com for your chance to win two free tickets to the Florida Panthers versus Chicago Blackhawks game on March 10th. Best of luck, everybody. So, Cats fans, how are you all feeling tonight? Because I'm feeling real good. The Florida Panthers, they have their first three-game winning streak of the season. And this is without their captain, Alexander Barkov. But actually, before I continue the show, just want to let you know that this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. And FanDuel is the official sportsbook partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. But once again, Cats fans, I feel really good. I hope you guys do too. It's been such an up and down season and right back in the race of the wild card. And it's Friday, which means it is a Fairbanks Friday edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast. And straight off the IR is Nick Fairbanks. Nick, welcome back for another edition of Fairbanks Friday. Thanks for having me back, uh, Armando. And yeah, the IR was uh, a little, little tricky. I uh, had to kind of travel a little bit and then come back home. So uh, thanks for having me back on. Absolutely. You t- had to take care of a little bit of business uh, out of town, but glad that you uh, made it back. Um, I asked Jacob this question uh, earlier this week, and I want to get your, uh, your input on it as well as you made your return to South Florida uh, mm-hmm. towards the tail end of All-Star Weekend. And you actually were able to be at the All-Star game on yep. last Saturday. So tell tell everybody your thoughts on the Panthers hosting the All-Star game. Well, number one, I think the organization did a great job, um, you know, setting up, you know, not only for fans, you know, different activities around the area and everything. Um, I know that Saturday was... Uh, a little, you know, uh, it, some events got canceled because of the weather, but, you know, everything else went according to plan. Um, other than that, I thought the actual three on three games were actually pretty entertaining. Um, I thought they kind of, kind of started off slow. And then once the Atlantic and, um, you know, the, <laughs> the Atlantic division came on, that's really when the fireworks started going off. And uh, Matthew Chuck showed why he deserved to be uh, an all-star and actually win the MVP. Yeah, and something I forgot to mention on the show is uh, when I, I, I believe I forgot to mention it was uh, when he w- when we were all at the beach bash on Saturday night. Uh, Matthew Kachuk was wearing a Jalen Waddle jersey out. So not only did he uh, win All Star Game MVP, but he was uh, repping the hometown team here in <laughs> South Florida. So just overall, uh, overall, just a great experience, and glad that you and and the wife got to enjoy your your time here for All Star Weekend. But let's just go right into this game for the Florida Panthers versus the San Jose Sharks. And, you know, the San Jose Sharks, they were feeling they're feeling themselves. They're feeling a little co- confident after coming back uh, from behind against the Tampa Bay Lightning. Of course, it was a Brian Elliott start because it was the second end of a back to back for Tampa Bay coming out with a win. Uh, it was a shocking win, of course, of uh, justice for Victor E. Rat after everything that happened. <laughs> but uh, feel, feeling a little confident, they got up to a one nothing lead without. Sasha Barkov too, uh, and Sergey Bobrovsky. He was the story of that first period. Even though the San Jose Sharks got off to a 
one nothing uh, lead very early on. Now this is their second win of the season when they trail after period one. And that's t- in two out of their last three games, Nick, that that has happened. Well, the previous 51, <laughs> it, when they when they fell behind after one, they zero wins. So that's absolutely incredible what's happened in the last three games for the Panthers. Of course, and you kind of see the team, you know, over the last couple of weeks, even just before the all-star break in their week of, um, you know, layoff and everything, uh, that, you know, things were starting to kind of, you know, turn around the corner. You could tell that the team was playing with more confidence, that a lot of the, you know, defensive issues and a lot of the what I call brain dead plays uh, were kind of not there anymore. And you could tell that everybody was just they're feeling really good about, you know, what they were doing. Um, So to see them coming into a game like this, you know, potential trap game. I mean, Tampa Bay fell into it. Um, You know, you have Bobrovsky in there and he's been playing lights out since he came back from injury. I mean, he had the game against Tampa. um, He had his last game, sorry, that he played really, really well in and uh, really deserved to get the win in that one. But he really was the reason why Florida won this game, in my opinion, outside of the fourth line. Um, You know, he kept him in the game in the first period when you need your goalie to bail you out. But then there was a couple of other transition saves that he needed to make that, you know, maybe earlier in the season he wasn't able to make or he just didn't. So um, definitely kudos to him and uh, thankful that he was in that tonight. Yeah, and the San Jose Sharks, uh, they led the they led the way in the first period in slot shots, six to one. The Panthers were having a hard time uh, clearing the zone, and, and and as well as not sustaining their own uh, pressure on the San Jose Sharks. And once again, this was without Sasha Barkov. And it's funny because the way I saw Paul Maurice discuss the whole Sasha Barkov injury, we were all thinking that he was going to play. And it's funny, the gamesmanship kind of reminds me of a, another former uh, coach in in, in, South, in the South Florida sports scene, Don Mattingly of the Miami Marlins. He always would say one thing about injuries, and then it would be longer than expected. And it's now it's like a fool me once. Uh, it's like fool me once, shame on you. Now it's fool me twice, shame on me, because uh, I believe uh, that th- this isn't the first time that Paul Maurice has uh, done this. But I think, I think somewhat has to do with the opponent but the other part has to do with um what exactly what Paul Marie said not something that you want to linger and you know this is a marathon not a sprint and we I even tweeted it before the game no captain no excuses H- how did you feel about how Paul Maurice handled the the Barkov uh injury no issues at all um you know I, I think you know when it comes to you know, preparing for an opponent, you always want to have them guessing or having them game plan a certain way so you can kind of throw them off their game or at least get the jump on them. And unfortunately, San Jose did get the jump on the Panthers tonight. So it's not like, you know, <laughs> it really worked at all. But I mean, you know, coaches do this all the time. Um, I think the probably the thing that annoys fans the most is that, oh, you know, he might be ready to go on Thursday. Why, why don't you just take that verbiage out and just say, you know, he's close to coming back? And just leave mm-hmm. it at that. Be be as vague as possible. Cause you know what? You he, he could have been vague about, you know, Spencer Knight or Bob, you know, when they had their injuries and everything. And it seemed like they were a game or two away and it turned out to be weeks. So um, you know, with Barkoff and everything, who knows how long it's gonna be. I just I'm glad that it's not requiring surgery at this point because there's been multiple players uh this season that have taken a shot off the hand and they've missed probably a month, month and a half just from healing. So uh, just grateful it's not that bad. Yeah, and you mentioned a great point that you mentioned with Spencer Knight because we thought he was going to start on that tail end of a back-to-back right before the All-Star break, and then Alex Lyon gets both of those sets of back-to-backs, and we're just sitting here all confused the whole time when, mm-hmm. when, it, when it comes to that. So now, Panther fans, just we're at that point in the season when Paul Marie says one thing, just – Expect it to be a little longer and just lower your expectations when it comes to a player uh, coming back. And now Spencer Knight has, will be going over a month uh, since his last start. Crazy to uh, believe. But we're going to discuss more of this game and the 4-1 win over the San Jose Sharks. The Panthers' first three-game winning streak of the season. But first, we're going to tell you all about FanDuel Sportsbook. And FanDuel Sportsbook is the official sportsbook partner of 
the Locked On Podcast Network, and they're also the number one sports book in America, FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. Download FanDuel now so you can get Super Bowl 57 with a no-sweat first bet. You'll get up to $3,000 back in, a, in bonus bets with if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel lets you bet on everything from the money line, point spreads, to who will score a touchdown. FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and easy to use. Best of all, you get paid on your winnings instantly. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. Second segment here on this Friday, February 10th edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast, where the Florida Panthers are coming off a four to one stressful win yes stressful win over the san jose sharks where we spoke about the first period for the cats uh, of course a, a goal that we're not gonna put blame on bob it was uh it was an eric carlson shot of course now <laughs> continuing to create his lead on points for defensemen he's the, he's definitely uh the norris trophy winner th- this year but of course we got there we got all not only we got to mention the top line of etulus terrain Sam Reinhart and Anton Lindell only played four uh, games uh, this season, but even prior to that, they were playing third line minutes when they were together. Mm-hmm. So big difference when you're going against the opposition's uh, th- third line. So they, they were playing. Of, of course, we we know who the opponent is. So, but at the same time, the getting when when the opportunity is called without your captain as well, and we also think about this with Sam Reinhart even though it was not officially a goal in their first matchup against the San Jose Sharks where he got that shootout winner and going 12 games without a goal. And now we're at, we're at game 54 and he has 19 goals after that. Just incredible to, to, uh, to see how Sam Reinhart has exploded ever since game 13. Uh, I want to get your opinion on what you've seen out of, uh, Sam Reinhart in, in these last, uh, 40 plus games definitely still a streaky player um but definitely much more um of a concerted effort on his behalf um you know i was actually really glad that he was able to put in his first goal because he looked like he was going to pass the whole time and i'm like please just shoot it please just shoot it and you know it worked out it went right under the glove of um uh, santa jose's uh, goaltender so um i think he makes the smart plays um you know he's been big down the stretch i mean he I think he was the one that scored the overtime goal against Boston that they almost that they waved off and then eventually said that, you know, it did go in. Yeah. So he's been clutch. You know, he's had some pretty big goals so far. So, um, you know, it's something that he did also last season. So maybe this is something that, you know, the Panthers can, you know, definitely, you know, build upon and uh, definitely make sure that he's out there uh, when it matters most. So I've been very happy with him. Uh, the first period, uh, you know, was kind of concerning with that first line. I know that they were just trying to gel together and everything, but, as you were saying, you're going against the top line of San Jose. And, you know, those are not some slouch players. Those are some real big guys. And, uh, you know, they know how to put the puck in the back of the net. Yeah, Timo Meyer, who has 30 goals. Thomas Hur- Hur- Hurdle, who got an eight-year extension just uh, last season, who's very capable of, of getting on the score sheet as well. And e- even in that in that first goal for uh, Sa- Sam Reinhart, you – Think about how the Florida Panthers through the mo- first three or four minutes of that of that second period they they they're dominating the zone time and then you have a little bit of a stretch that San Jose is getting some um, sustained zone time as well, mm-hmm. um, kind of like how they were in the first period and then they auto- they go on a rush. Mark Stahl with a beautiful stretch pass to Sam Reinhardt and then wrist it past a uh, uh, Kapokakinen. But then that second one. What a beauty of a pass by Etu Lusterinen, or as David <laughs> Dork of Local Ten says, Etuanon, as he's falling backwards. <laughs> and 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 if you look at the replay again, Sam Reinhardt, as soon as he forechecks Eric Carlson, he's off to the races, right to the net. Forechecks, boom, he's skating. And then Lundell, it, it, and and Randy Moeller was talking about how that's a set play right off the forecheck as well, about just getting getting to the net as well. And then, uh, but as Etu is falling backwards, that's the most impressive part about <laughs> it, it all, about how he's able to get past. Uh, to, 
I want to get your opinion about the degree of difficulty to get that uh, get that to uh, Rhino to just tap it in five hole on capping in. Some people would call it luck, to be honest with you. Um, the fact that he was able to do that, and uh, you know, with <laughs> Brian Hart's soft hands, just to just gently tap it. Uh, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of finesse in order to do that. So I was very happy to see that he decided to just do a tip in instead of playing the puck hard and trying to go around Kakanen. Um, it just, it worked out, you know, for the best. And, you know, as you were saying, Moeller said that that's a set play. Yeah. As soon as the forward gets in and challenges that defender uh, to give up the puck and everything, the first thing you should do, um, hopefully since your team is going to retrieve the puck is go right to the net because you're going to get a chance right away. You don't have anybody who's trying to box you out most of the time. And on top of that, it's just you and the goalie. So why not, you know, get, get a good scoring chance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and it's just pure instincts on that. And, and the best part is that, you know, you're getting, you're getting your chances. And of course, San Jose is getting their chances as well. And then it, it, it was a goal that happened towards the end of the period. So just a different type of, momentum uh ch changing play for for the panthers but also uh also i, I want to give an honorable mention uh to that third line of of eric stall ryan lomberg and nick cousins i i actually have the numbers uh here for for uh for them and let's also consider that without barkoff and everybody moving up that you gotta uh, crunch your minutes a little bit and and so the top the the top nine was getting the majority of the ice time. Uh, like honestly, you, you look at uh, you look at the top line of uh, Sam Reinhart, Anton Lundell, and 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 Etu. Twelve minutes. Uh, the Sam Bennett line, fourteen minutes. Uh, Eric the, the Stall line, ten minutes. And then the the Chris Tierney, Giovanni Smith, Colin White line, way way below um, them, like by over by over five minutes. So you're crunching mm -hmm. a lot of those minutes as well. But the Lomberg stall in 10 minutes and 57 seconds. Look at the take a look at this. Shot shots on goals, um, shots, uh, shot attempts 19 to 5 when they were on the ice. Good for a Corsi four percentage of eight. They're consistently creating pressure in the in the shark zone on the four check. The sharks were having a hard time clearing. My goodness. And mm -hmm. and of course, we know the energizer bunny that Ryan Lomberg is. And he was mic'd up tonight. And I and I tweeted this joking around, obviously saying, I kind of want to see a mic'd up version of Ryan Lomberg unfiltered. You, you know, I I think ev a lot of fans do. So, uh, <laughs> how about your thoughts on that on that third line for the Panthers? Well, they were the best line uh, of the game. I mean, uh, you know, when the Panthers and the Sharks are kind of going back at it, you know, it, it just it really felt like a playoff game where they were just trying to feel out, you know, each other and really understand you know, what they needed to do to score. The third line was able to apply the pressure that kept the Panthers in the game, um, even, you know, starting in the first period. But, you know, they weren't really rewarded until the end of the game when they were put out there in a penalty kill situation and empty net. So, um, you know, hats off to them and hats off to Maurice to actually putting them in that position. Um, but, you know, Eric Stahl, you know, what a story he's been this season for the Panthers. And um, I might hurt some Panthers faithful with this, but um, – you might have to check the stats on this. I think he has as many, or he just passed Jonathan Uberto and the amount of goals they have this season. <laughs> wow, what a stat! What a stat! It, it, um, I, I'll look it up. I'll look it up a little later. <laughs> but incredible if, if that if that is the case. I, I was I did not think that I did not I would not have had that on my bingo card for uh, for Eric Stahl passing uh, Huberto on that and. Let, let's talk about that last penalty kill for for the Panthers. The uh, double minor, of course. Mm -hmm. Ekblad takes a, a pretty boneheaded penalty uh, mm -hmm. on a double minor on Timo Meyer, um, right, 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 right near, right near Bob. And um, but the amount of times that the Panthers were just sacrificing the body, especially Gus Forsling, who <laughs> a few times tonight uh, <laughs> broke his stick on some shot attempts, but him, Brandon Montour, who. Brandon Montour didn't even miss a shift after uh after getting uh after trying to lay out a hit and him getting the worst of it as well. And Montour, Gudas pinning to the boards, and then that intercepting pass by Etulus Sturanen as well to get it to Eric Stahl, and then Eric Stahl mm -hmm. intercepting that pass as well. That penalty kill for the Panthers, although it's been an issue this season, a little bit of an encouraging night uh for for the Panthers. 
Definitely. And uh, when you when you know who the power play is going to go through or, you know, what the offense is going to go through, like Eric Carlson and the season he's having, yeah, you got you to D him up a little bit. And I think that's what allowed Eric Stahl to be actually pretty uh, effective on the power uh, or the penalty kill towards the end of the game because you could see he was just swarming uh, Carlson and he kind of um, allowed the Sharks to kind of like, hey, there's a open passing lane here. Yeah, go ahead and pass it to him and boom was able to take it and uh, outskate Carlson to put in the fourth goal. So um, it seems like the Panthers have figured out a couple of things. Um, I would still like to see them more aggressive uh, just because I think that that allows them to have a little bit more energy in the game and allows them to kind of upstart their offense. But also it's going to dismay the, the the team that's on the power play and it's going to wear them out too, saying like, oh, you know, like what are we doing out here and not allowing them to get set for their uh, power play. But you know, tonight it was very effective, and they were able to uh, fend off a four-minute uh, penalty kill at the end of the game, which I really hope Aaron Ekblad starts to understand that he needs to, like, stop taking dumb penalties towards the end of the games because he could start costing the team some games. Yeah, and uh, we, we've been uh, we've been very vocal about our opinions on Ekblad this season, and uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's been at times justified um, for, for it. But also worth mentioning is the uh, – what do you think of the Panthers getting away, possibly getting away with uh, too many men on the ice uh, penalty when when that when that shot hit Gudis and Montour was uh, getting off the ice? Happens every game. Um, it's up to the referee's discretion and what they want to call and what they don't want to call. So uh, I'm not going to be too sad about it. But am I going to be surprised if they call it next game? No. No. Okay. <laughs> fair, fair, <laughs> fair enough. I'm going to be political. I'm going to be political about this one. But but Montour was a good distance away from the bench when that, when that happened, but it was a, but Hey, uh, we're, we're not, we're not complaining. It's a, it's a win, a four, one win and a three game winning streak uh, for as, the Panthers. So as long as it wasn't, this season. as long as it wasn't the ref that doesn't like Paul Maurice. So yes, I'll, just, uh, I'll just say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, so we're, uh, and the best part is the Islanders uh, did lose in regulation to the Vancouver oh. Canucks. Uh, Anthony v- Bavillier, got the game-winning goal for oh. the Canucks. And Bo Horvat did score against his former team, but in a losing effort. So now one point behind the New York Islanders with a game in hand on them. So great great night for the Florida Panthers overall. But we're going to transition over to segment number three, where we're going to talk about Saturday's game for the Florida Panthers and some news on a possible outdoor game for involving the Cats. We're going to discuss that next here on the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast. Your Locked On Panthers, your daily podcast on the Florida Panthers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Third and final segment on this Friday, February 10th edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast. Once again, it is a Fairbanks Friday edition of the show where Nick Fairbanks is here on uh, where we're celebrating a three game winning streak with the Florida Panthers 4-1 win over the San Jose Sharks. So, Nick, uh, Kevin Weeks did tweet the other day that there there is in the works of a possibility that the Florida Panthers and the Tampa Bay Lightning could be playing in an outdoor game at Raymond James Stadium. Of course, the if you if anyone doesn't know where that is, that is the home of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. <laughs> it is a fully outdoor venue in the state of Florida. And Nick, I want to ask you, how realistic does it sound for the for this uh, game to happen for the Panthers to have a possible stadium series game or slash winter classic? Uh, I'm going to put it at, I, I think in a way, I think they're just placating Florida fans and uh, not just Panther fans, but maybe Tampa Bay fans as well, because, you know, the humidity down here is real. Um, that ice yes. could melt really quick. So, um, I, number one, I'm glad that you mentioned that Joe Robbie was in Tampa because there's a bunch of fans from North of the border. I won't say which cities, but you know, we're complaining that, you know, maybe if it was in South Florida that we wouldn't, uh, fill out the, uh, you know, the stadium for an outdoor game, but in Tampa there guys a little bit north so where they won the Stanley Cups but um, I think that they would have to do a window of like maybe two to three weeks 
uh, when the weather does get cooler uh, down here, just to make sure that number one, the humidity does leave and that it is a sustainable, um, you know, way to create ice or have ice stay, um, you know, within the stadium. Uh, they're going to have to come up with something, um, whether it's going to be just, I don't know, to be I honest with you, I'm, I, I'm not a scientist. I'm not anything like that. You know, I'm, I have no idea how they're going to do it. Um, I will say, though, that if they're able to do some kind of, you know, stadium that kind of has a cover over it where it is outdoor. Uh, but still have a, a cover that goes over it to kind of, you know, help eliminate the elements, but also kind of, you know, allows you to control the temperature within the stadium. That would be preferable. Now, if that's the case, they should move it down to South Florida, where we actually do have a couple of stadiums that are like that, that would uh, give us the best chance at a outdoor game in Florida. Yeah, and I get it why they're putting Tampa Bay as the home team and thinking about it because they are the ones that have the mm-hmm. have had the most success uh, recently. So I get it why they would want the that that as the home team. But at the same time, Lone Depot Park where the Marlins play, I think that's a more sustainable solution because if the ice does happen to melt, you have the possibility of closing the roof and at least still opening the windows uh, for for the and, and at le- in left field as well. Um, but at the same time you think about you think about it is it really an outdoor game if the uh, if the roof is closed as well so there's that double edged sword when it when it comes to that as well so it just makes for a really hard situation to uh make it happen i hope it does there's one event that happened that well at least used to happen here in orlando called light up ucf uh, an opportunity to ice skate in the winter down here it's an outdoor rink and they make the ice every year it's it's not a year round rink and that mm-hmm. is some of the worst ice that I skated on because <laughs> of the humidity. It's a real. It's not the smoothest ice to skate on, and and I'm skating on it most times when I go at night. So it's I don't know how it, it's gonna. Of course, it's gonna have to be an evening game where there you're not gonna do that during the day, obviously. No. So I don't. I just don't know how it happens. So you're either gonna plan in November when the first cold front usually comes in, or you're gonna have to wait till after. Uh, you know, Christmas time, you know, into January when the cold front, you know, kind of just stays here for a little bit. So, um, you know, you got to get the meteorologists in here. You got to get people who really know how to, uh, I guess, keep a rink cold. And you're going to have to, I don't know, they may have to do something to the ice. You know, they they may have to, I I don't know what they could do. Like, I I don't want to say like, hey, they can put some kind of chemical in it and stuff like that, because it could be harmful to the players, um, you know, if it starts evaporating breathing it in could be harmful as well. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. But uh, if there is a game in Florida and it's outdoor, I'm there. And I know you're going to be there too. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't miss that for the world. But Mm -hmm. before we get out of here, let's uh, transition over to to, uh, Saturday's game versus the Colorado Avalanche. Last game of the five-game homestand right before the Florida Panthers will go to the Midwest and Washington and Nashville right before – and the, after that, they won't be leaving Florida for a while. Um, so, so great situation for the Panthers to be in right now. Now, just a few points out of a wild card spot. Mm-hmm. But when the Florida, when the Colorado Avalanche do come to town, it'll be a Kale McCarr-less Colorado Avalanche as he's out for the next two games of the road trip for the Colorado Avalanche. He didn't play against the Tampa Bay Lightning, which the Tampa Bay Lightning won five nothing, and mm-hmm. that's a different team without Kale McCarr. And but. They do have reinforcements back uh, with uh, Bowen and Byram and Valerie Nuchuskin, yep. but still mm-hmm. not to the level of Kale McCarr. And I didn't watch any of the highlights yet for Avs Bolts, but just him alone just changes the dimension of that of that Colorado Avalanche team. So maybe in a little bit of an advantage, uh, Panthers come Saturday. You hope so. And yeah, anytime you have a uh, Con Smythe winning defenseman out of the lineup, you have to take advantage of it. I mean, he, you know, as you said, he puts a different dimension on that team, whether it's defensively or mostly offensively. His skating ability is next to none. And what he is able to do, um, you know, in opening up plays and creating passing lanes is ridiculous. So Florida actually, you know, is going to be uh, on the receiving end of, you know, the positive news with that. So they'll be able to play their game a little bit more. I think they can play more of the physical game and everything, but they'll still have to shut down McKinnon, which he's killed the Panthers in the past. Miko Rotten is the same thing. I mean, just they got to play their game and be able to shut down the stars, um, you know, that they can. Now, 
you know, when it when it comes to the Colorado Avalanche, I don't I don't think of goaltending outside of Patrick Watt. They I don't think they have strong goaltending at all. So it's really gonna see. I really want to see how Colorado is gonna be able to defend the Panthers' attack. Um, hoping that Barkov is gonna be back and that they'll be able to uh, generate some offense and hopefully we'll be able to chase a goalie or two. Yeah, and and you mentioned the goaltending. They won in spite of the goaltending last year with Darcy Kemper in that and. And let's not forget that the Panthers survived a little, a little bit of a scare last go around when they yeah. uh, when they made their uh, trip to uh, Denver, and then of course Matthew Kachuk scoring on the on the power play to give the give the Panthers a lead with a with a few minutes left, and that was a four one. Let's not forget that was a four one lead, and and the 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 injuries to the Pan- to the Avalanche were worst at that time. They've gotten a little healthier, but. Their main guy, the the probably the most, I don't think there's a hot take. They're probably their most important player on the team, n- not there. And of course, their captain, um, uh, Gabriel Landeskog, hasn't played at all this season uh, mm-hmm. so far. So uh, hopefully, with uh, with the captain being back, which that's that's the hope. There was no other injuries tonight for the Panthers, neither. And they'll be practicing once again tomorrow, so they'll be getting back on the ice, which. Paul Maurice is emphasizing a lot of practice now that the majority of their schedule is is at home too, so less travel mm-hmm. and and this embracing the grind as well. So that I I, I this is <laughs> this, this seems to be a very favorable stretch for the Panthers. Most definitely, and they have to take advantage of it. I mean, they've done their dirty work on the road and everything, and you know they've had mixed results, but they're still in it. They still have a good chance to uh, do some home cooking and really put themselves in a good position to be, uh, you know, in the wild card spot. They're not going to, they're definitely not going to chase the top three in the Atlantic. So that's fine. But, you know, let's start taking out teams like Pittsburgh, the Islanders and Washington Capitals. So, um, you know, now's their time to shine. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so with two more matchups against Washington, two more matchups against Buffalo, even though Buffalo has four, four games in hand. So that's definitely one to look for, and one more versus Pittsburgh uh, late later on in uh, in the season. But Nick, I want to thank you so much once again for joining me on this Fairbanks Friday edition of the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast. Great to have you back from the IR. So <laughs> tell everybody where they can find you online. Thank you again for having me on, and uh, I will be here to stay. I don't plan on uh, having any other injuries coming up soon or any business travel. Um, But I will say you guys can follow me on Twitter at Prudentia Zero. And if you guys want to follow me on Twitter on Monday, I will be at the Minnesota Wild and Florida Panthers game. Uh, I am traveling up north, so um, I will be in enemy territory. So please drop a line, and uh, if there's anything you guys want me to find out or uh, find out about the Minnesota Wild, I will definitely do my best. But Armando, thank you again. And before we get out of here, I hope that when you go to the state of hockey that you try the Juicy Lucy. Look, look, look that up, uh, Panther fans. The, the Juicy Lucy is a very uh, it's a very popular food item in the Twin Cities. So, Nick, okay. thank, thank you so much and, and see you next week. See you next week. And if you like what you're hearing, please subscribe to the podcast to be notified every single time the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast jumps into your podcast feed make sure to subscribe to the other shows on the locked on nhl network including locked on nhl locked on fantasy hockey with flip livingstone and steel Roden, and locked on nhl prospects thank you for making the locked on florida panthers podcast your first listen of the day and for your second listen of the day make sure you listen to today's episode of locked on sports today peter bukowski gives you a 20 minute or less podcast on the entirety of the sports scene with exclusive interviews and the take of the day Follow Locked On Sports today on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. So I'm Armando Velez with Nick Fairbanks. And you've been listening to the Locked On Florida Panthers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. <laughs>